Marcius in Flanders by Vernon Lee. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Tony Addison. Marcius in Flanders by Vernon Lee. One. You are right. This is not the original crucifix at all. Another one has been put instead. Il y a un substitution. And the little old antiquary of Dunas nodded mysteriously, fixing his ghost seer's eyes upon mine. He said it in a scarce audible whisper for it happened to be the vigil of the Feast of the Crucifix, and the once famous church was full of semi-clerical persons decorating it for the morrow, and of old ladies in strange caps, clattering about with pails and brooms. The antiquary had brought me there the very moment of my arrival, lest the crowd of faithful should prevent his showing me everything next morning. The famous crucifix was exhibited behind rows and rows of unlit candles and surrounded by strings of paper flowers and coloured muslin and garlands of sweet resinous maritime pine and two lighted chandeliers illumined it. There has been an exchange, he repeated, looking round that no one might hear him. Il y a un substitution. For I had remarked, as any one would have done at the first glance, that the crucifix had every appearance of French work of the thirteenth century, boldly realistic, whereas the crucifix of the legend, which was a work of St. Luke, which had hung for centuries in the Holy Sepulchre at Jerusalem, and been miraculously cast ashore at Dunas in 1195, would surely have been a more or less Byzantine image, like its miraculous companion of Luca. But why should there have been a substitution? I inquired innocently. Hush, hush, answered the antiquary, frowning. Not here later, later. He took me all over the church, once so famous for pilgrimages, but from which, even like the sea which has left it in a salt marsh beneath the cliffs, the tide of devotion has receded for centuries. It is a very dignified little church, of charmingly restrained and shapely Gothic, built of a delicate pale stone, which the sea damp has picked out, in bases and capitals, and carved foliation with stains of a lovely bright green. The antiquary showed me where the transept and belfry had been left unfinished when the miracles had diminished in the fourteenth century, and he took me up to the curious warder's chamber, a large room up some steps in the triforium, with a fireplace and stone seats for the men who guarded the precious crucifix day and night. There had even been beehives in the window, he told me, and he remembered seeing them still as a child. Was it usual here in Flanders to have a guard room in churches containing important relics, I asked, for I could not remember having seen anything similar before. By no means, he answered, looking round to make sure we were alone, but it was necessary here. You have never heard in what the chief miracles of this church consisted. No, I whispered back, gradually infected by his mysteriousness, unless you allude to the legend that the figure of the Saviour broke all the crosses until the right one was cast up by the sea. He shook his head, but did not answer, and descended the steep stairs into the nave, while I lingered a moment 
looking down into it from the warder's chamber. I have never had so curious an impression of a church. The chandeliers on either side of the crucifix swirled slowly round, making great pools of light, which were broken by the shadows of the clustered columns, and among the pews of the nave moved the flicker of the sacristan's lamp. The place was full of the scent of resinous pine branches, evoking dunes and mountainsides, and from the busy groups below rose a subdued chatter of women's voices and a splash of water and clatter of patterns. It vaguely suggested preparations for a witch's sabbath. What sort of miracles did they have in this church? I asked when we had passed into the dusky square. And what did you mean about their having exchanged the crucifix about a substitution? It seemed quite dark outside. The church rose black, a vague lopsided mass of buttresses and high-pitched roofs against the watery moonlit sky. The big trees of the churchyard behind, wavering about in the sea wind, and the windows shone yellow like flaming portals in the darkness. "'Please remark the bold effect of the gargoyles,' said the antiquary, pointing upwards. They jutted out vague wild beasts from the roof-line, and what was positively frightening, you saw the moonlight yellow and blue through the open jaws of some of them. A gust swept through the trees, making the weathercock clatter and groan. "'Why, those gargoyle wolves seem positively to howl!' I exclaimed. The old antiquary chuckled. "'Ha, ha!' he answered. "'Did I not tell you that this church has witnessed things like no other church in Christendom, and it still remembers them? There!' Have you ever known such a wild, savage church before? And as he spoke, there suddenly mingled with the sough of the wind and the groans of the weather vane, a shrill, quavering sound as of pipers inside. The organist, trying his vox humana for tomorrow, remarked the antiquary. Two. Next day I bought one of the printed histories of the miraculous crucifix which they were hawking all round the church, and next day also my friend the antiquary was good enough to tell me all that he knew of the matter. Between my two informants the following may be said to be the true story. In the autumn of 1195, after a night of frightful storm, a boat was found cast upon the shore of Dunas, which was at that time a fishing village at the mouth of the Nice, and exactly opposite a terrible sunken reef. The boat was broken and upset, and close by it, on the sand and bent grass, lay a stone figure of the crucified Saviour, without its cross, and, as seems probable, also without its arms which had been made of separate blocks. A variety of persons immediately came forward to claim it. The little church of Dunas, on whose glebe it was found, the barons of Croy, who had the right of Jetsam on that coast, and also the great abbey of saint Lou of Arras, as possessing the spiritual overlordship of the place. But a holy man, who lived close by in the cliffs, had a vision which settled the dispute. St. Luke in person appeared, and told him that he was the original maker of the figure, that it had been one of three which had hung round the holy sepulchre of Jerusalem, that three knights, a Norman, a Tuscan, and a man of Arras, had, with the permission of heaven, stolen them from the infidels, and placed them on unmanned boats, that one of the images had been cast upon the Norman coast 
near Salonel, that the second had run aground not far from the city of Lucca in Italy, and that this third was the one which had been embarked by the knight from Artois. As regarded its final resting place, the hermit, on the authority of St. Luke, recommended that the statue should be left to decide the matter itself. Accordingly, the crucified figure was solemnly cast back into the sea. The very next day, it was found once more in the same spot, among the sand and bent grass at the mouth of the Nis. It was therefore deposited in the little church of Dunas, and very soon indeed the flocks of pious persons who brought it offerings from all parts made it necessary and possible to rebuild the church thus sanctified by its presence. The Holy Effigy of Dunas, a Sacra Dunarum Effigies, as it was called, did not work the ordinary sort of miracles, but its fame spread far and wide by the unexampled wonders which became the constant accompaniment of its existence. The effigy, as above mentioned, had been discovered without the cross to which it had evidently been fastened, nor had any researches or any subsequent storms brought the missing blocks to light, despite the many prayers which were offered for the purpose. After some time, therefore, and a deal of discussion, it was decided that a new cross should be provided for the effigy to hang upon. And certain skilful stonemasons of Arras were called to Dunas for this purpose. But behold, the very day after the cross had been solemnly erected in the church, an unheard of and terrifying fact was discovered. The effigy, which had been hanging perfectly straight the previous evening, had shifted its position, and was bent violently to the right, as if in an effort to break loose. This was attested not merely by hundreds of laymen, but by the priests of the place, who notified the fact in a document existing in the Episcopal archives of Arras until 1790, to the abbot of St. Luc, their spiritual overlord. This was the beginning of a series of mysterious occurrences which spread the fame of the marvellous crucifix all over Christendom. The effigy did not remain in the position into which it had miraculously worked itself. It was found, at intervals of time, shifted in some other manner upon its cross, and always as if it had gone through violent contortions. And one day, about ten years after it had been cast up by the sea, the priests of the church and the burghers of Dunas discovered the effigy hanging in its original, outstretched, symmetrical attitude. But, oh wonder, with the cross broken in three pieces, lying on the steps of its chapel. Certain persons who lived in the end of the town nearest the church, reported to have been roused in the middle of the night by what they had taken for a violent clap of thunder, but which was doubtless the crash of the cross falling down. Or perhaps, who knows, the noise with which the terrible effigy had broken loose and spurned the alien cross from it. For that was the secret the effigy made by a saint and come to Dunas by miracle had evidently found some trace of unholiness in the stone to which it had been fastened. Such was the ready explanation afforded by the prior of the church in answer to an angry summons of the abbot of St. Lou, who expressed his disapproval of such unusual miracles. Indeed, it was discovered that the piece of marble 
had not been clean from sinful human touch with the necessary rites before the figure was fastened on, a most grave, though excusable, oversight. So a new cross was ordered, although it was noticed that much time was lost about it, and the consecration took place only some years later. Meanwhile, the prior had built the warder's chamber with the fireplace and recess, and obtained permission from the Pope himself that a clerk in orders should watch day and night on the score that so wonderful a relic might be stolen, for the relic had by this time entirely cut out all similar crucifixes, and the village of Dunas, through the concourse of pilgrims, had rapidly grown into a town, the property of the now fabulously wealthy Priory of the Holy Cross. The abbots of St. Lou, however, looked upon the matter with an unfavourable eye. Although nominally remaining their vassals, the priors of Dunas had contrived to obtain gradually from the Pope privileges which rendered them virtually independent, and, in particular, immunities which sent to the treasury of St. Lou only a small proportion of the tribute money brought by the pilgrims. Abbot Walterius, in particular, showed himself actively hostile. He accused the prior of Dunas of having employed his warders to trump up stories of strange movements and sounds on the part of the still crossless effigy, and of suggesting to the ignorant changes in his attitude which were more credulously believed in now that there was no longer the straight line of the cross by which to verify. So, uh, finally, the new cross was made and consecrated, and on Holy Cross Day of the year the effigy was fastened to it, in the presence of an immense concourse of clergy and laity. The effigy, it was now supposed, would be satisfied and no unusual occurrences would increase, or perhaps fatally compromise, its reputation for sanctity. These expectations were violently dispelled. In November 1293, after a year of strange rumours concerning the effigy, the figure was again discovered to have moved, and continued moving, or rather, judging from the position on the cross, writhing. And on Christmas Eve of the same year, the cross was a second time thrown down and dashed in pieces. The priest on duty was at the same time found, it was thought, dead in his warder's chamber. Another cross was made, and this time privately consecrated and put in place and a hole in the roof made a pretext to close the church for a while, and to perform the rites of purification necessary after its pollution by workmen. Indeed, it was remarked that on this occasion the prior of Dunas took as much trouble to diminish, and if possible to hide away the miracles, as his predecessor had done his best to blazon the preceding ones abroad. The priest, who had been on duty on the eventful Christmas Eve, disappeared mysteriously, and it was thought by many persons that he had gone mad and was confined in the prior's prison for fear of the revelations he might make. For by this time, and not without some encouragement from the abbots at Arras, extraordinary stories had begun to circulate about the goings-on in the Church of Dunas. This church, be it remembered, stood a little above the town, isolated and surrounded by big trees. It was surrounded by the precincts of the priory, and save on the water-side by high walls. Nevertheless, persons there were 
who affirmed that the wind having been in that direction, they had heard strange noises coming from the church of nights. During storms particularly, sounds have been heard which were variously described as howls, groans, and the music of rustic dancing. A master mariner affirmed that one Halloween, as his boat approached the mouth of the Nis, he had seen the church of Dunas brilliantly lit up, its immense windows flaming. But he was suspected of being drunk, and of having exaggerated the effect of the small light shining from the warder's chamber. The interest of the townsfolk of Dunas coincided with that of the priory, since they prospered greatly by the pilgrimages, so these tales were promptly hushed up. Yet they undoubtedly reached the ear of the abbot of St. Luc, and at last there came an event which brought them all back to the surface. For on the vigil of all saints, 1299, the church was struck by lightning. The new warder was found dead in the middle of the nave, the cross broken in two, and, oh, horror, the effigy was missing. The indescribable fear which overcame everyone was merely increased by the discovery of the effigy lying behind the high altar in an attitude of frightful convulsion, and, it was whispered, blackened by lightning. This was the end of the strange doings at Dunas. An ecclesiastical council was held at Arras, and the church shut once more for nearly a year. It was opened this time and re-consecrated by the abbot of St. Loup, whom the prior of Holy Cross served humbly at Mass. A new chapel had been built, and in it the miraculous crucifix was displayed, dressed in more splendid brocade and gems than usual, and its head nearly hidden by one of the most gorgeous crowns ever seen before, a gift, it was said, of the Duke of Burgundy. All this new splendour, and the presence of the great abbot himself, was presently explained to the faithful, when the prior came forward to announce that a last and greatest miracle had now taken place. The original cross, on which the figure had hung in the church of the Holy Sepulchre, and for which the effigy had spurned all others made by less holy hands, had been cast on the shore of Dunas, on the very spot where, a hundred years before, the figure of the Saviour had been discovered in the sands. This, said the prior, was the explanation of the terrible occurrences which had filled all hearts with anguish. The holy effigy was now satisfied, it would rest in peace, and its miraculous powers would be engaged only in granting the prayers of the faithful. One half of the forecast came true. From that day forward, the effigy never shifted its position, but from that day forward also, no considerable miracle was ever registered. The devotion of Dunas diminished. Other relics threw the sacred effigy into the shade, and the pilgrimages dwindling to mere local gatherings, the church was never brought to completion. What had happened, no one ever knew, guessed, or perhaps even asked. But when, in 1790, the archiepiscopal palace of Arras was sacked, a certain notary of the neighbourhood bought a large portion of the archives at the price of waste paper, either from historical curiosity, or expecting to obtain thereby facts which might gratify his aversion to the clergy. These documents lay unexamined for many years, till my friend the antiquary bought them. Among them, taken helter-skelter from the archbishop's palace, were sundry papers 
referring to the suppressed abbey of St. Lou of Arras, and among these latter a series of notes concerning the affairs of the Church of Dunas. They were, so far as their fragmentary nature explained, the minutes of an inquest made in 1309, and contained the deposition of sundry witnesses. To understand their meaning, it is necessary to remember that this was the time when witch trials had begun, and when the proceedings against the Templars had set the fashion of inquests which could help the finances of the country while furthering the interests of religion. What appears to have happened is that after the catastrophe of the Vigil of All Saints, October 1299, the prior of Bain de Luc found himself suddenly threatened with a charge of sacrilege and witchcraft, of obtaining miracles of the effigy by devilish means, and of converting his church into a chapel of the evil one. Instead of appealing to high ecclesiastical tribunals, as the privileges obtained from the Holy See would have warranted, Prior Urbane guessed that this charge came originally from the wrathful abbot of St. Lou, and, dropping all his pretensions in order to save himself, he threw himself upon the mercy of the abbot, whom he had hitherto flouted. The abbot appears to have been satisfied by his submission, and the matter to have dropped, after a few legal preliminaries, of which the notes found among the archiepiscopal archives of Arras represented a portion. Some of these notes, my friend the antiquary, kindly allowed me to translate from the Latin, and I give them here, leaving the reader to make what he can of them. Item. The abbot expresses himself satisfied that his reverence the prior has had no personal knowledge of or dealings with the evil one, Diabolus. Nevertheless, the gravity of the charge requires... Here the page is torn. Hugues Jacob, Simon Le Couvreur, Pierre Denis, Burgers of Dunas, being interrogated witness, that the noises from the Church of the Holy Cross always happened on nights of bad storms, and foreboded shipwrecks on the coast, and were very various, such as terrible rattling, groans, howls as of wolves, and occasional flute playing. A certain Jehan, who has twice been branded and flogged for lighting fires on the coast, and otherwise causing ships to wreck at the mouth of the Nice, being promised immunity, after two or three slight pulls on the rack, witnesses as follows, that the band of wreckers to which he belongs always knew when a dangerous storm was brewing, on account of the noises which issued from the church of Dunas, Witness has often climbed the walls and prowled round in the churchyard, waiting to hear such noises. He was not unfamiliar with the howlings and roarings mentioned by the previous witnesses. He has heard tell by a countryman who passed in the night that the howling was such that the countryman thought himself pursued by a pack of wolves, although it is well known that no wolf has been seen in these parts for thirty years. But the witness himself is of the opinion that the most singular of all the noises, and the one which always accompanied or foretold the worst storms, was a noise of flutes and pipes, quad vulgo de cunta flustes et musettes, so sweet that the King of France could not have sweeter at his court being interrogated whether he had ever seen anything, the witness answers that he has seen the church brightly lit up from the sands, but on approaching found all dark, save the light from the warder's chamber, that once by moonlight the piping and fluting and howling 
being uncommonly loud, he thought he had seen wolves and a human figure on the roof, but that he ran away from fear and cannot be sure. Item. His lordship the abbot desires the right reverend prior to answer truly, placing his hand on the gospels, whether or not he had himself heard such noises. The right reverend prior denies ever having heard anything similar, but being threatened with further proceedings, the rack, acknowledges that he had frequently been told of these noises by the warder on duty. Query whether the right reverend prior was ever told anything else by the warder. Answer, yes, but under the seal of confession. The last warder, moreover, the one killed by lightning, had been a reprobate priest, having committed the greatest crimes and obliged to take asylum, whom the prior had kept there on account of the difficulty of finding a man sufficiently courageous for the office. Query, whether the prior has ever questioned previous warders? Answer, that the warders were bound to reveal only in confession whatever they had heard, that the prior's predecessors had kept the seal of confession inviolate, and that though unworthy, the prior himself desired to do alike. Query, what had become of the warder who had been found in a swoon after the occurrences of Halloween? Answer, that the prior does not know. The warder was crazy. The prior believes he was secluded for that reason. A disagreeable surprise had been apparently arranged for prior Urbain de Luc, for the next entry states that Item By order of his magnificence the Lord Abbot, certain servants of the Lord Abbot aforesaid, introduce a Robert Boudoun, priest, once warder in the Church of the Holy Cross, who has been kept ten years in prison by his reverence the prior, as being of unsound mind. Witness manifests great terror on finding himself in the presence of their lordships, and particularly of his reverence the prior, and refuses to speak, hiding his face in his hands and uttering shrieks. Being comforted with kind words by those present, nay, even most graciously, by my lord the abbot himself, Etienne threatened with the rack if he continue obdurate. This witness deposes as follows, not without much lamentation, shrieking, and senseless jabber, after the manner of madmen. Query. Can he remember what happened on the vigil of all saints in the church of Dunas, before he swooned on the floor of the church. Answer. He cannot. It would be sin to speak of such things before great spiritual lords. Moreover, he is but an ignorant man and also mad. Moreover, his hunger is great. Being given white bread from the Lord Abbot's own table, witness is again cross-questioned. Query. What can he remember of the events of the Vigil of All Saints? Answer. Thinks he was not always mad. Thinks he has not always been in prison. Thinks he once went in a boat on sea, etc. Query. Does witness think he has ever been in the church of Dunas? Answer. Cannot remember, but is sure that he was not always in prison. Query. Has witness ever heard anything like that? My lord the abbot, having secretly ordered that a certain fool in his service, an excellent musician, should suddenly play the pipes behind the arras, at which sound witness began to tremble and sob and fall on his knees and catch hold of the robe even of my lord the abbot, hiding his head therein. Query. Wherefore does he feel such terror? 
being in the fatherly presence of so clement a prince as the Lord Abbot. Answer, that witness cannot stand that piping any longer, that it freezes his blood, that he has told the prior many times that he will not remain any longer in the warder's chamber, that he is afraid for his life, that he dare not make the sign of the cross, nor say his prayers, for fear of the great wild man, that the great wild man took the cross, and broke it in two, and played at quoits with it in the nave, that all the wolves trooped down from the roof, howling, and danced on their hind legs, while the great wild man played the pipes on the high altar, that witness had surrounded himself with a hedge of little crosses, made of broken rice straw to keep up the great wild man from the warder's chamber. Ha! 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 He is piping again. The wolves are howling. He is raising the tempers. Item, that no further information can be extracted from witness, who falls on the floor like one possessed, and has to be removed from the presence of his lordship the abbot, and his reverence the prior. 3. Here the minutes of the inquest break off. Did those great spiritual dignitaries ever get to learn more about the terrible doings in the Church of Dunas? Did they ever guess at their cause? For there was a cause, said the antiquary, folding his spectacles after reading me these notes. Or, more strictly, the cause still exists, and you will understand though those learned priests of six centuries ago could not. And, rising, he fetched a key from a shelf, and preceded me into the yard of his house, situated on the Nis, a mile below Dunas. Between the low steadings, one saw the salt marsh, lilac with sea lavender, the island of birds, a great sandbank at the mouth of the Nis, where every kind of sea-fowl gathers, and beyond the angry white-crusted sea under an angry orange afterglow. On the other side, inland, and appearing above the farm roofs, stood the church of Dunas, its pointed belfry and jagged outlines of gables and buttresses and gargoyles and wind-warped pines, black against the easterly sky, of ominous livid red. I told you, said the antiquary, stopping with the key in the lock of a big outhouse, that there had been a substitution, that the crucifix at present at Dunas is not the one miraculously cast up by the storm of 1195. I believe the present one may be identified as a life-size statue for which a receipt exists in the archives of Arras, furnished to the abbot of St. Luc by Estienne Lamas and Guillaume Pernel, stonemasons, in the year 1299, that is to say, the year of the inquest and of the cessation of all supernatural occurrences at Dunas. As to the original effigy, you shall see it, and understand everything. The antiquary opened the door of a sloping vaulted passage, lit a lantern, and led the way. It was evidently the cellar of some medieval building, and a scent of wine, of damp wood, and of fir branches from innumerable stacked-up faggots filled the darkness among thick-set columns. Here, said the antiquary, raising his lantern. He was buried beneath this vault, and they had run an iron stake through his middle, like a vampire, to prevent his rising. The effigy was erect against the dark wall, surrounded by brushwood. It was more than life-sized, nude, the arms broken off at the shoulders, the head, with stubbly beard and clotted hair, drawn up with an effort, the face contracted with agony, the muscles dragged as of one hanging crucified, the feet bound together with a rope. The figure was familiar to me in various galleries. I came forward to examine the ear. It was leaf-shaped. Ah, you have understood the whole mystery, said the antiquary. 
I have understood, I answered, not knowing how far his thought really went, that this supposed statue of Christ is an antique satyr, a Marcius, awaiting his punishment. The antiquary nodded. Exactly, he said dryly. That is the whole explanation. Only I think the abbot and the prior were not so wrong to drive the iron stake through him when they removed him from the church. End of Marcius in Flanders